Bridges are wild. Form a bridge means a royal bridge. You see a bridge? They raise you three bridges. Bridge! Hello and welcome to Triple Dummy Episode 9. I'm Peter Hollins and with me as usual I've got Nick Jacob. Unfortunately Elena's not around, but we've got uh, guest speaker Sataj Hounds to join us. Thanks for joining us, Sataj. Um, today we're going to be talking about a few different things. We've got uh, ideas on teaching philosophy. We'll also talk about a book that Sataj is writing about the 2014 Risinger. Uh, a bit of an update on uh, cheating scandals and uh, then a bit on uh, psychology of when you're playing either a really strong pair or a really weak pair. But um, over to Sataj, what are you, uh, what's your general teaching philosophy? What do you reckon works and what doesn't? Well, um, I, I think in general uh, when people pursue bridge improvement they tend to focus on the wrong things. Um, for example, if you had a partnership and they said, you know, we are really working hard these days, it normally means they are doing one of two things. A, they're getting together, they're discussing some system and they're coming up with some fancy shenanigans which makes them feel good about what they're doing. Or B, they are playing together in some competition or another and they call it, they call it training. Right? They call it, we're practicing, sorry. You know, so, so, so these are two, and to me, both of these are very limited in their effectiveness in terms of genuine improvement and raising your level. So, for and I, I create a parallel to this to, to a domain like chess where all of this stuff has been studied and written down and um, you know there is a lot of emphasis on on actually improving real skills. So I think to in terms of teaching, in terms of being a good teacher, if you are genuinely interested in improvement, you would, the last thing you would teach, for example, is conventions. Yeah. Um, because they have very limited utility. And so I personally feel a teacher should be, should emphasize methodologies, you know, just uh, methodologies and mistakes and how to deal with them and how to improve your own processes. Sorry, it was a long yeah. rant, but no. it's, uh, it's a bit... <laughs> What, yeah, teach mistakes? Quite, yeah. yeah, it's uh, and it, that's really good as well because it's quite holistic. It's not just about teaching people who are complete beginners to the game. You're giving, you're teaching people good principles that they will learn to apply for each hand, for each card, and yeah. hopefully for their whole bridge careers. And I know from experience, uh, when I learned the game, I didn't, I didn't really learn the. Well, I learned it in kind of a roundabout way, I suppose. I sort of taught myself bridge playing parents, but they didn't push it to me. I didn't take any lessons. You know, so I was learning stuff like double squeezes before I knew <laughs> how to, you know, count where points were or right, right. Uh, all, these, all these little things. And it's kind of... I feel, I feel that if you're given a grounding in... In good principles, in you know, looking for mistakes, in um, making sure that you have a, a routine that works for you. So counting points, shape, uh, winners, losers, what's to clear doing. So you have some basic things that you can keep doing, um, and which it also helps you get faster faster at working yeah. out. Yeah, you know, Nick, there was a time in my life where I sort of thought, oh God, if if someone had just spent the right five hours with me ten years ago, I could have progressed those ten years yeah. like two. You know, <laughs> yeah. with, with right with some with fierceness. And it's like, yeah. bloody hell, why did someone tell me this? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, know, why you read all this fancy and I read every practically every bridge book I could lay my hands on. It's like mm -hmm. why didn't someone tell me like every hand, for example, Count the shape, count the points, count the tricks. Why don't everything just tell it and force it down yeah. the throat, you know? Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you, you can't believe how many books there are entitled Modern Bidding Theory and stuff in my dad's library. And it's just, you know, modern, modern bidding theory from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. And it's all like you read for and you're like, oh, it doesn't really have much value nowadays. And yet you've got people pouring all this energy mm. into... You know stuff that you know is admittedly important, you know, important in partnership. 
One of the things I feel is that um, I've noticed over the years that when you have a set task, you know, you you teach someone something, they learn something, and it can be clearly articulated. It gives people a sense of accomplishment. Yeah. You know, I have learned stamen. You know, oh good, yeah. and then you use it at the table. Oh, I just used stamen, and mm -hmm. it's very gratifying for the students to kind of uh, have that sense of accomplishment. And so the teacher is like um, incentivized in a way to to, to pander to that. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's not necessarily the best way forward, but you know, I guess. Yeah, I think things like, so a lot of things are attractive because they help meet that sort of, you know, yeah, human yeah. kind of tendency. And what it I feels feel like a lot, yeah, it, it feels a lot as though um, teachers, especially teachers of beginners, um, are just trying to keep people interested for long enough. Whereas I kind of feel that those aren't the people to be targeting. The people to be targeting are the ones who love the cards and love you know, actually thinking about bridge, you know, other than that one little window on Wednesday nights that they go to the club and <laughs> learn for two well, hours. Well, I mean, yeah, I don't know. that's arguable, Nick. I'm, yeah. I'm not yeah. sure. Uh, what, do you, what, what do you find in your teaching, Pete? Um, I really focus on card play, basically, because I think like most people can bid to an appropriate level, and trying to improve bidding gets just a small edge, whereas teaching people the principles of card play, while it's really tough, I think, is applicable all the time. I know that uh, Millie, when he taught me, taught me just really basic system and just beat card play into, like, me and Justin and all that. And, like, yeah. we were playing, like, 1940s ACL, basically, to a world championship, mm -hmm. but could actually play cards. And then we eventually said, all right, maybe we can improve our bidding. But, like, mm -hmm. he spent all his teaching making sure we could actually play cards. So I reckon that's really important. Yeah. I think so too. I think at the highest levels, um, it's all in the bidding, but then that's because their level of card play technique is already so highly advanced that it's really hard to win swings in the play, you know? Yeah. Um, so people, some people say it's all about the bidding, which is kind of true, but that's when you have like really strong technique to back it up. And, yeah. yeah. I think it kind of goes like you get someone who knows nothing about cards at all and they need to know something about bidding such that they can bid game. Bidding's mm. really important there. And then mm. at the top end, bidding's really important because everyone can actually play cards. And no one really discusses yeah. that middle period where, hang on, you can get to a game contract. That's fine. You've done 90% of the work you have to do in the bidding. Yeah. Let's now teach you actually how to play cards. So and I reckon that's like the big gap that's missed in everyone's teaching. Mm. Yeah, I mean, what do you agree with? Yeah. Yep, absolutely. But I saw, like, Sataj, you've got, like, a... Um, Sataj has a website, by the way, satajhans.com. Mm. Check it out. Uh, you've mm. got, like, yeah. basically you say you should have, like, targeted aims when you're playing with people. You don't think that, like, just the pro student sort of play a duplicate kind of thing. It's not that... Yeah, I'm not a big fan of the pro uh, student setup where you play some random hands and some, you know, random things happen and then the pro offers some random advice. It, it can help. I mean, actually, one of my uh, findings in that is that if you are doing that, you should focus on maybe, you know, three or four things at most from a session, whereas some pros said, they, well, you know, that hand, you know, you should have played a club because <laughs> dummy had three small clubs. And then the next hand is like, well, I have made a cubit and, you know, we should bid four no front. When you get a certain level of competence in any domain, it can be, it's very easy to forget how hazy things are for, for some other people. And that's something I've learned firsthand that, you know, if you, you just make all these assumptions that they are capable of following all of this. And the reality is if you bombard them with information, very little goes through. Whereas if you, choose two or three really key points. This is something Bobby Richmond uh, told me once. He said, if he has the kind of client who wants to learn, he says, if you're junior, I just look at a hand record and I pick two and maybe some days three things and that's all I talk about today in the session. You know? Yeah. Eventually that sort of 
see through that was fun. And I, um, about my own personal approach, um, I like to believe um, that I have a good sense for what is lacking in any person because I can easily, like I know my own growth from being just a, a young, keen guy who wanted to read everything and was very keen to do well and, you know, um, to actually becoming, you know, a, a really strong player. And I know all the little weaknesses are sort of, I'm very aware of them in a way. Like I can, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, and sorry, I mean, so what I like to do is I can spot in, a, in my students what I feel is most lacking in their approach at the moment. You know, and it's not always hard play. A lot of it, for example, I'm noticing consistently in the bidding, a lot of people have very preset ideas based on points, and there's a very limited understanding of vulnerability and how that kind of revolves. And and once you have that, then there's the sophisticated understanding around partners' past hand status and partners' actions. And different different things are different for different people. I think people, everyone has their own biases in the way they play because they're usually people I work with have, have played for a fair amount, right? And they are well-developed skills in one area and really lacking in others. Um, and I feel like the best way of growth for anyone is to kind of identify the areas where they are most lacking and then kind of address those for now and then make progress on that and then kind of see something else. So that's kind of my approach. I try to do a little document where I write down a person's full profile um, about what I feel are their big weaknesses and strengths and then we start hitting the big weaknesses in kind of some sort of a structured way yeah i mean yeah w with some very good results actually i mean i've been surprised at, at how much when you've given the right methodology how quickly people can some of the people can improve yeah uh so talking about weaknesses i remember um i got asked what do you reckon your like my weaknesses were i was like everything like i can see all these areas where i'm so bad <laughs> I'm like, i don't know where to start i can improve on every area but yeah, i think it's helpful if you have someone else that is better than you tell you like this is your clear like yes you can improve on all these areas but yeah and the stronger the mentor the more like quality of feedback the more relevant it is likely to be you know the, because, yeah, if you get, like, everyone has opinions. Like, part of being a bridge player is to be, like, a bit opinionated. But, you know, <laughs> the quality of the opinion also matters. Bobby, again, Bobby Richmond used to have a great line. He said, so don't have opinions about your weaknesses and strengths. He says, just whenever you play a, a session of bridge, come back, look at a hand record, and see what could have done better. So I think our own personal impressions of ourselves can be somewhat limiting. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's quite good as well because sometimes you, and this is all kind of what we've talked about in the past as well, about looking at the hand records, reviewing what you've done. Sometimes you can see, oh, well, you know, Declare is always supposed to take 10 tricks and four hearts and they took their 10 tricks, you know, you know, yada, yada, yada. But I think it's important to push yourself further as well and to think, well, actually, you know, had I played the jack instead of the nine, maybe it would have given Declare a, a problem. And so you start thinking about these more and you start looking into these positions and it's, I, I kind of go with the principle that you, you when you're playing, mm -hmm. you, uh, you have not complete confidence or arrogance or fear or recklessness, but you do have a high level of confidence so that if stuff goes wrong, you're still okay. You're still yeah. confident that you're that you're going to play well, you're going to win, um, you're going to do the best you can. But afterwards, you want to have a large amount of doubt. You want to look at these things and think, well, actually, was this an automatic one no trump opening? I've got my 15 points, I've got my balance hand, but actually, you know, I've got all these, like, I've got these jacks and stray jacks and aces with just completely empty cards. And, you know, you kind of, you look at these things and you start thinking, well, actually, maybe I should be um, thinking more about how these hands fit together, how these combinations fit together. Looking at these, looking at these defensive holdings and and thinking, how can I give Declare a problem here? 
And, you know, you, you want to be able to do as much of that as you can at the table, but you definitely want to force yourself to do it if you haven't done it at the table in review, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, what you're saying. I think in a review, you've got to be very honest and very, perhaps, and very skeptical of some of the things. Um, yeah, but maybe, yeah, but it's difficult, you know. Like it's, it's not an easy thing to do. I actually think one of the important things to do in analyzing mistakes is to consciously accept what was it that you were really thinking at the table. I think most rich people, mm. players, kid themselves most of the time. They do something stupid, then they'll spend some time and, oh yeah, you know, I thought he was 5-4-3-1 because, you know, he led the two of diamonds and he had bit spades. They'll build a little story <laughs> after the thing to kind of justify their action. And most of us do. I do. Everyone does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I just think for growth, you kind of have to push yourself to be honest and see what were you actually doing? What were you thinking? And, you know, what were the, all these other factors at play? And, mm. It's yeah. hard. It's hard to be to be honest with yourself. I find what helps is recording it as you do it. <laughs> Putting a video <laughs> up online. <laughs> <laughs> what recording is recording? These are my thoughts, and that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. <laughs> but that's like, that's what you do, don't you? Yeah. you do some and you talk about. Oh my god! <laughs> Makes it hard to feel lie so to yourself. Bad, I... Yeah, I'd I'd be writing stuff like. Why was I looking at trick two if partner played the seven or the five? Or <laughs> yeah. Why? why? Hey, yeah, what the hell did he play? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've had situations right where my partner's given me a card and I wasn't I wasn't concentrating hard enough and I didn't I I didn't give him a hold and holding I didn't put the card into this holding and I had to choose between two options. And I guess wrong, and the contract makes. And partner says, "Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I gave you the wrong card." And I'm like, "Oh, so he did play." <laughs> and I'm like, "I have no idea what he played. I was just guessing anyway." And he's he's apologising to me. We're both yeah. so <laughs> far away from concentrating on yeah. That yeah. trick two in this hand. Yeah. It's, you know, and you have to look at those. And and actually, like it's it's nice to laugh about, but really, these things are just you know they're just baby things that you should be very honest about as you say Sataj and you know and actually record as you do Pete how, <laughs> how many of these things you have made unnecessary mistakes on because of a lack of concentration or because of thinking the, along illogical lines or whatever it is it's very important because that's such a huge leak for so many people I know that like when playing an event, like in the earlier stages of the event, when I don't feel like the super amounts of pressure and mm. my biggest mistakes in those sorts of times is just six tricks in, I have no clue what three of the cards were. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's not just one card. It's like, oh no, <laughs> like, my partner's given me two signals. I missed both of them. This third <laughs> signal, I have no idea what it is because I don't know what those signals it's like, yeah, yeah. Yep. So my that. biggest improvement is look at the cards that were played. I find it very helpful. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, we'll move on to the next topic, which is Taj. You've been writing a book on the 2014 Rising. What's that all about? Yes. Yeah, so, um, well, thank you for uh, featuring that in this uh, podcast. Yeah. Um, it's, um, we played the Rising the last year, it was quite eventful, and I felt like a lot of cool hands came up, hands with, uh, that were very, uh, uh, conducive to be written about, um, you know, like you play a lot of bridge, and I do a lot of writing, as well. I do some writing, and you know, it, it can be hard to spot hands, and yeah. I just felt like the tournament was very rich in the nature of the situations which came up, especially at water max scoring. So I aim to write a book, which I've completed. Um, I'm in the editing phases, so I need to probably finish that, get someone else to do a little edit, and then probably come live with it. So it, I try to f I'm trying to feature actual problems faced by people at the table, yeah. um, and say, well, there are limitations in a book format, obviously, but you know, it's it's a lot more interactive than a typical bridge book is. Your typical bridge book is. All right, Helgamo had this hand, so you know he won the hard lead and he ran six spades. This was the position, 
well, now he exited the club and the guy was in play. You know, well done. Ha ha. You know, well done. Mayor Helgemo. And I tried to kind of just say, well, you know, so this is the problem. What is your general plan? And then create a situation, say this, this, and this has been discarded. What do you do now? So uh, I'm trying. I'm, I'm attempting to do something um, on those lines. And also I try to, I'm trying to cover a bit more um, the psychological side of performance, you know, the sort of stuff no one ever seems to write about, you know, yeah. the Brit top Brit was all like, ha, 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 check me out, I'm so cool, you know, <laughs> or God alive, it's a douche, I can't play cards. For but, you know, a lot of stuff goes in, there's emotion, and um, it's an area that doesn't get much uh, traction, so I yeah, talk about a few events and incidents from the thing, and now, obviously, with the whole cheating scandal, um, I've had to make a few changes to the text <laughs> over the past <laughs> uh, couple of months about some of the hands, and I've got hands featuring the very guys, and yeah. it's incredible. Like, for example, I'll give you a hand. What do you guys think it features in the book as a lead problem? Yeah. Um, you hold three, three, five, two. Yep. Yeah. Jack to three, three low, queen, ten, fifth, and jack and one. Mm -hmm. Strong hands. Goes it goes a spade from partner, double a spade from partner. Yeah, you go a spade from partner, pass, and you bid two spades. Yeah. It goes double on the left. Your partner bids three spades. Yeah. Pass, pass. And it goes double again. Pass, four hearts on your right, all pass. So you have jack to three, three low, queen ten fifth, and jack and one. So it's your lead. Uh, yeah. So my first question is, do you like your lead? You know, do you have a very strong conviction about your lead? No. I think a spade no. is a possibility. A trump's a possibility. Not sure about the minors. If I, I don't think I'm swinging a minor because I have no idea. But it's definitely between a trump and a spade. And what do you think? Nick? Well, I, I got into a slightly heated argument about it, but... Um, oh, this actual hand? Well, when you brought it up um, in Sydney. Oh, right. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> so, no, I was interested to hear Pete's thoughts before off on my own. Um, so, yeah. I, however, I will offer a disclaimer. I got into the argument before I knew that it was border match. I thought that it was in Oh, sorry. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's a back to match. Yeah, I meant but, yeah. yeah, I should have said that. Yeah. No, no, it's okay. You eventually did clarify. But the problem was the damage had been done and we still argued about the imps <laughs> problem rather than <laughs> <laughs> the actual border match problem. Um, so, I completely agree with Nigra for that, that leading a club again at border match is crazy. Um, it's, I mean, it's just, I mean, sure, you're, I mean, my argument was that at imps, you know, when you have nothing and no tricks um, and partners spades aren't providing tricks, then I'd be more inclined to let the club and try and score a rough. But at border match, you're just going to drop so many tricks when, you know, on this auction, it feels like the contract is... Is it is probably a favourite, right? It's, I, 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 it's, I, I, actually, I mean, I may not totally agree with that. I just think, like, I raise this hand as I just think all suits are kind of possible, you know, like something or the other. Yeah. You know, okay, maybe. Uh, yeah. I mean, and maybe a club perhaps is not as attractive as the others, and maybe even a diamond is not. But whatever, they're all possible. Yeah. Yeah. To have some have a little leg up from partner on a hand like that can just swing so much, you know. Yeah. Um, and yeah. while maybe our opponents were not, uh, who knows how sophisticated their agreements were on this on the, the sophisticated cheating agreements. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> on this hand, you know, the guy swung the jack of clubs and dummy had queen third, partner ace king fifth, club 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 rough, boom, you know, like that's yeah. the other. That's what you say. Well, okay, nice lead. You know, you led a club because you had a weak hand and you strike hoping to partner strike with some strength. It's always very easy to justify it with some little wishy-washy narrative. You know, that's the thing about bridge. And yeah. so I present this, uh, presented it as a problem. And I initially, I sort of just put it in there saying it's somewhat random and the guy got, you know, lucky or maybe he had better judgment. Yeah. But now, in, in the light <laughs> of events, you know, it's yeah. better methods. to know what, what, what really went on. Yeah. So that's yeah. the way in which I had to alter the book a little bit. Um, to, to accommodate that. But it's coming together and I mean I'm hoping 
Right. Any, by the way, anyone interested can register for it because I'm going to do a limited print run um, on my website, sitajhands.com slash book. There you I just, I just did this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's very easy to register. I highly encourage it. So I even had a little thank you note for me, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any uh, hands in it which, like, ended up completely mundane but you thought were like really interesting problems and you weren't sure like I reckon like there's lots of hands where you start playing them and you're like oh my god what if it's this option or this option turns out nothing mm. actually mattered but do you have hands like yeah. that? It's funny it's funny you say that because I've just written an article for bridge winners that'll come up in a day or two that covers just the same thing I, I had this most cool hand in my mind I was just like yeah, you gotta watch it you gotta watch all the possibilities and yeah. tell them it was just a that hand where you know even even my grandma would have made it. So yeah. and, well, it was kind of cool at the time. I'm not sure if there's any such hand in the book. But, uh, there's there's over about 60, 70 hands, if not yeah. more. I mean, from I just think memory might be skipping. Yeah. Context. Mm. Cool. Yeah. So again, one of the things about writing as well. Um, sorry to okay. interrupt, but just. Um, I mean, it's obviously a very different style of writing, but when I was doing some bulletin work, it's, you know, you have to capture, the, and it, it's the same is true for um, for writing about play at the highest level, for writing about getting people into the mind of an expert uh, at the table. You, what you That's the key thing, getting into the minds of people, getting mm. at the table, getting people feeling like they're at the table, getting the sense for... Where the, where the cards are um, and that's kind of one of the things that I found you know I played at the Bermuda Bowl for the first time and all so many of the, the best players there they just they just had this kind of feeling to them you know they just they they could sense where things were and some it's almost you know there was heaps of logic going on there as well but it's it's very different you know, playing at the club and playing in local Australian and New Zealand tournaments, mm -hmm. even at even at national tournaments. Yeah, I mean, yeah. playing at this level. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's really good. I'm I'm excited to read about it. Yeah, yeah. There's actually a hand right in there. Um, I won't devil too many details, but there was a hand which really mean. It was a hand I had against Gloria Versace because I take a few tangents of the main pitch, but other hands which made an impression on me. And there was a hand where, you know, basically I was declarer and. I stopped to think, and because I stopped to think, they, they just mm. took an inference, which was, oh my god, you know, the guy just basically pounced on the fact that I stopped to think. Mm. They could play, which you would say, wow, that is just absolutely bizarre. How can you make yeah. it? Yeah. It was a winning play. And he took it out of his sense of presence, at yeah. this sort of doubt that he read into. into yeah. I like uh, something yeah. else. What are your thoughts on, like, how often do you take plays based on tempo? I know that I love to try and read what opponents are doing based on a tempo. And, um, Not that much. I try, you know, it's like, I, li I like to say that there's two kinds of players. There's, and I've played with quite a lot with both types. One is the types who wants to get every hand right. You know, he just cares about this hand and then, so this kind of player is, is very stylish, flary, reads the table, blah, blah, blah has some spectacular hands. This is one example I would say people like Peter or Ishmael are in that in that sort of category, right? Yeah. It has some mm -hmm. great famous flowery hands. No one really likes to play against this sort of person or Mextroth in at the very mm -hmm. yeah. um, and they don't they no one they obviously they know all the technique, they know all the aspects of it, but they they're solely focused on getting this hand right. Which, you know, it's easy to believe that's the right way to play, but it also leads to some ridiculous results, you know. It also leads to um, a lot of volatility in, in your style of play. Um, the other style of play is the one which is obviously the greatest uh, exhibit of it, someone like Tony, you know, Tony Nunn. He, all he aspires to is just you're big and, you know, not big, just beautiful bridge. He just... He's always, he, he watches everything, he knows everything, but he's always aspiring to the opponent's doing the right thing, playing for his legitimate chance, and all of that kind of stuff. Very, very technically flawed. So that when the hands over, you can say, well, I didn't, 
yeah. wonderfully. And you know, I think like maybe I'm not doing enough justice. It's easy to kind of criticize that to say, well, why aren't you? But I, I think there's a lot of value in that because you're very clear what your goal is, and it's very good to to have a person like that as a teammate. I mean, Tony is a perfect teammate. You know. Yeah. Mm. The ground as the partner. No, I, didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't say that. He's, the, he's a very good partner. But totally perfect teammate. You know, if you make your three no six hundred at your table, you know, if it can go down at your table, you know, he will do it. And if you beat him there three no, which could have made, you know, you, he he doesn't. He's very low volatility player in that sense. Yeah. And you you need a lot of um, sort of sense of confidence and belief in your way of playing to take that. So I really admire that. And I guess about players at the top level, maybe someone like Eric Rodwell would, would, would go that way. So there, there you go, there, you know, two of the very best players in the world, like Max Stoth Rodwell play. There's a difference in the way they play. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, I've seen so many hands, but I've seen two things, which is like, wow. Uh, like Mech. You know, Mech had, against me, he had, had nine third in dummy and ace check fourth in the hand. Yeah. Now, the normal thing is to play low towards the jack, on a 10 doubles on onside, or king queen onside, or something, right? Mac can be down to 9, or 9 low low. <laughs> he just ran the 9, and he had no 8, no 7, he went 7, and he was 9 to yeah? I'm like, what the hell? What happened? Oh, he's going to the 9. Wow. <laughs> so, it's typical, those sort of situations. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm a bit of a mix of the two. Kind of lean towards um, the classical. Cool. What do you reckon you are, Nick? Well, I mean, this is kind of like the, you know, the famous questions: What's your favorite animal, and what's your second favorite animal? <laughs> As in, you know, what do you want to be, and who are you actually? So, um, yeah, I, I really want to. Um, I want to be a less volatile player, um, and I suppose I'm, you know, I, I am moving along that trend. Um, I started off as a, an extremely volatile player, um, just, you know, the ability to generate stuff from absolutely nothing, you know, we'd have an option like, I mean, this is from the NOT, um, last year, so not, not even that long ago, you know, I went to this option, one spade on my right, pass from me, pass on the left, two diamonds from partner, pass on the right, two hearts from me, non-forcing, pass four hearts, pass six hearts. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they made the wrong lead and it made, and it was like, all right, sweet, 14.30 or whatever. <laughs> Um, and, you know, there was some rationale for my decision making. You know, I didn't want to overhaul two hearts because I had primary strength in spades. Yeah, yeah, sure. And then when partner bid two diamonds, I had a void in diamonds, and I was like, well, where's, where's this hand going? Let's put a heart there. But, you know, again, I could just, you know, I could make up reasons for what I was doing. Um, and, you know, it probably wasn't the right thing. It certainly led to a great result, but um, there were numerous positions in the auction where some, you know, some sounder approach would have, you know, guaranteed the four hearts plus one, um, rather than risking, you know, playing in two hearts or defending a spade or, you know, all this other stuff. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I am quite a feel player or, you know, um, a touch player, like giving a lot of, you know, um, I don't know. I'll give, maybe, I guess I guess I guess it's probably giving away quite a few opportunities. Um, you know, make it making a bit more mistakes than I should. Um, doing some really good things, hopefully. But um, I, I really want to build towards a less volatile approach. You know, less mistakes, less flashiness, but just straight up, straight down the middle. Um, more accurate. More accuracy in both card playing and card watching, um, accuracy in the bidding, which is again something. I mean, and actually, you've talked about this is a bit of a tangent, right? This is something that Sataj has talked about quite a lot, um, and it's kind of the 
uh, I'm just trying to I'm trying to remember the the way you describe it, but it's it's like the difference between model and delivery, uh, or there's what's the um that interaction like how you uh, you know oh, it's kind of like the theory versus yeah, how you yeah, practice the, it. Yeah, concept and, and delivery. So yeah, concept. That's it. Yeah. Your yeah. Conception and within the conception, you only have to deliver a certain percentage of it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I kind of want to, I want to align the delivery, especially in in the bidding, with my concept. I mean, conceptually, I'm you know a pretty reliable bidder. I'm, I have quite a decent understanding of positions, vulnerabilities, all that sort of stuff. But at the table, I'm just complete field bidder. You know, yeah. right. make wild preempt at you know at vulnerable, and not, but just because <laughs> I have the sense of something, and you know, you kind of like, <laughs> yeah. I don't, you know, at some point you have to, you know, I mean, you don't have to explore both ways of playing, but I feel I feel that it's important to at least have some familiarity with, you know, the sound Tony Nunn style of play and, um, you know, of just of not making mistakes, of putting constant pressure on um, in that way versus the mixed drop way, which is also putting constant pressure on, but because of the, you know, um, the aggression, the uh, in-your-face nature of the player, the ability to steal things from you, and you know, it's. I think I think it is important to know how to use each style. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I think yeah, the best way has to be a combination of the two: knowing when to go this way, when to go that way. Kind of. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we'll move on to. The next topic, um, but before we do, backtracking a little bit, if anyone wants to find Sataj's book, again that's at satajhans.com, which is S-A-R-T-A-J-H-A-N-S.com, that's his website, go check it out. Um, but anyway, uh, we're going to do a quick uh, cheating scandal update, uh, which mainly, uh, there's been more evidence posted against uh, Belichy's Medzinski. Um, so earlier on they posted some stuff and, you know, there was some hypothesis about what was going on, but uh, they posted a little bit more detail on that. You can check that out on Bridge Winners. Won't go into too much detail about it, but I was more interested in um, your feel of being cheated uh, or playing against the accused cheaters. So Sataj actually played uh, the Transnationals in, what was it, 2013? Was it Sataj? I'm sorry. And we lost to Fisher Schwartz? Yeah, we played mm. Fisher Schwartz. Yeah. Um, the transnational final. So you actually got a silver medal in a world championship that might might have been a goal if uh, you didn't play against people that were accused of cheating. Um, what are your thoughts on do you feel robbed or what? Uh, it's, it's hard. I mean, it's quite a mixed emotion. Well, a lot of other teams got robbed as well. I mean, they knocked over a couple of big names. You know, the big team with Mekwa Parnet. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, like, I certainly don't feel outraged that they kind of... I don't know why that is. Yeah. It's shocking. Looking at some of the hands today, it's like, oh my God, like, it's so obvious. I wrote an article about it in Australian Bridge. <laughs> and so I went through some of these hands, like, how could you even, my God, you know, for example, I'm sure it's a famous hand, he had some hand, ace, third, club, jack, fourth, diamond, ace, queen, fourth, spade, and ten and one half. Sorry, it's not very, but it's basically some boring four, four, three, two hand, it goes one, no, all pass, and then a club from ace, third. So I think because it was the final of a world championship, they actually got a bit too desperate, whereas other times they've had time, hands where... They haven't gone with partners' lead. They kind of just sort of say, "Well, that is too obvious." Yes. And um, mm. yeah, they got very desperate. And you know, it's yeah. I mean, it would have been like our life could have been totally different if we had won a world championship um, <laughs> as opposed to those guys. And so you know, it's like bit of a sense of yeah, having been stolen from in that sense. But also, like a lot of time has passed, so it's more contemplated rather than. 
But there's a lot of other people who have a lot more to uh, complain about. Some of the, you know, the Meckroths and the Steve Weinsteins and the like, you know, they've lost multiple times to these people on multiple occasions. I reckon, most, I reckon most of the outrage is actually from Europe who have been playing against these people all their lives, mm. basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that has to be. I mean, I've, you know, I've, I've had results against almost all of these cheating players where, you know, they've uh, you know, close match here or there, like, you know. Um, mm. some, a lot of other people have taken a lot more pain. Yeah. Mm. Saying to Nick earlier that uh, my only um, result against uh, a pair that's been accused of cheating is against Balikis Medzinski, and I beat them. So <laughs> I'm not I'm not really one to feel much pain here. So <laughs> oh, that was that um, that quarterfinal in the NOT or something when you guys pulled up a big upset, wasn't it? Uh, no, I played them over in Sanya. All right. Yeah, cool. Yeah. yeah, no, I um, I only had one match against uh, any of the accused against Pikeric and Smirnov. We lost by about seven TMs. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I don't I don't think cheating was a big part of part of that of the you know sixteen boards or however. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not you know, not too better. <laughs> I mean, like things happen at the bridge table, which you always kind of think about a year later. On one hand, I remember in particular against. Smudzinski, the bidding went something like I opened a diamond, Tony bid a spade, and I bid one no trap. Yeah. And, and he made a lead. And he made a lead, he was my screen mate. And a trick two or three, some of the early play, he sort of looked at me and he said, one, four, 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 something like that. To me, as in, ah, you know, you've done a little singleton once, uh, one no trump bid or something. And I remember thinking at the time, I said, well, he can't have had enough information at this point in the play to know that that was my shape. Right? Yeah. And then I sort of looked at some other, well, I guess he inferred from the fact that I played this suit that I had that. You know, and I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. You know, like that was my takeaway from the little incident. We had a little joke behind the screen at our side of the screen and one, two, three, four. And now maybe like he was showing him little, you know, a little help. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> With a little, a little four flashing from over the other side of the screen. Yeah. Uh, you know, who knows? But, you know, yeah. little things like that. Just remember, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I reckon that would be interesting to like get someone who cheats to give you some like information about a hand, and then you go, how the, how could they work that out? And then you think for like ten minutes on all the random inferences you could get. You might actually stretch yeah, yeah. your own knowledge of the game. Trying to emulate yeah. what they can do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's one of the things the uh, well, the peop all these people that are writing about, and they say that one of the ways they pick potential candidates is by that they stop at moments where other top players won't stop and think. And I mean, having said all of that, I think you know there is a bit of a culture of paranoia about these sort of things, and I just hope that it doesn't become which will become the worse off for, for a huge heightened paranoia about cheating. I can't imagine a whole lot more players. Well, there might be, there are some more, I suppose. But. Yeah. But I reckon the paranoia is going to fade away. It will always be there a little bit, but it's only been about 13 weeks since this all started. But if you give it a year's mm. time, then, like, yes, there'll be like, oh, maybe this person cheating, but. Lots of people will think, well, we, we got rid of most people or whatever. Like, yeah, I hope so. Um, well, or, you know, and maybe there are still yeah. mm. so. It's tough. I mean, probably the, well, it's so hard to put a price tag, if you will, on how much the bridge world has been robbed mm. by over the past decades. Mm. Um, especially with this last decade, and you know, people you get go up some of the old guard like Bobby Wolf coming on Bridge Winners and writing comments about how you know the robbing has been going on for much longer than that. Mm. And you know, it's kind of, I mean, it is important for us to work it work out a way, not so much of catching cheaters because the cat the catching process is 
just so arduous for everyone involved. It's yeah. it's incredibly painful, um, and you know all the allegations and the paranoia that goes along with it. But it's almost a culture needs to be some cultural or professional change, um, and unfortunately, you know the likely well, I mean maybe, maybe not the likely result, but one thing that could happen is that the WBF loses a lot of its um, position of authority, privilege, all this sort of stuff because of the way that it's managed the cheating scandal so far. Yeah. And, you know, you kind of, you don't like to think of a, you know, of a future bridge world which is divided as the chess scene was divided for a long time. Um, but these are, these are sort of the things that we have to be prepared to deal with. Um, and I know personally I would, you know, like nothing more than for some of the cultural elements that are at the root of these cheating problems to be cleaned up, you know, and if that's through a, a union of professional players where there's more self-policing and more there's more um, accountability on the individual player um, to, to the group, to the union, uh, something like that. I don't know what I don't know what's required. Sure, sure what uh, union business, you know. I mean, yeah. I will say a couple of things. I mean, in spite yeah. of this, I mean, Jay Lau made a comment. Um, I think I'm pretty sure it was an online post where he said that amongst the top in the American players, they play each other in the regional circuit. There is that sort of self policing, and there are people yeah. who are somewhat dodgy one way or another, but with the pressure, they kind of seem to adjust. So you know, I guess there is some. Yeah. 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 Some, some influence. Yeah, that's true. It's really finding a way to to bring the Europeans into the um, Europeans, Asians, um, people from outside of that, you know, highly structured, highly regular. Um, a, a, a scary, a scary comment there, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Europeans and Asians and Czech is good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow, well, I could have, you know. Uh, well, it's yep, not hard. Hard. No, no American player has been busted, which is, I mean, I guess the, the the case. Some people argue that you know there's no video footage on them, so we can't really know this limited footage. Yeah. Who knows? Yep. Yep. That is tough. Yeah, it is tough. So who knows? I mean. But it is surprising that you know I've been going to the U.S. nationals. And, the last four or five years, and whenever anyone talked about cheating, and I said, you know, who, in your opinion, like this last year, I spoke to one of the very, you know, very good player in the U.S. and I at dinner, and I'm like, so in your opinion, how many, of, how many pairs in the top 30 teams in the spin goal are cheating? And he said, well, is it cheating as in cheating, cheating? I'm like, yeah, we're not talking unethical behavior. We're talking predetermined. Signals and routines, and he said three. And guess what? One, two, three busted in the cycle. Were well, those one, two, three pairs? You know, and yeah. I, I had like similar discussion multiple people, and though the, the, the Balik Yusuzinski was a big shock, I think, to a lot of people, just because mm -hmm. they have a lot of flair, I suppose, in the play, and they were. Um, so you know, I was very surprised, and a lot of people had those three pairs in their minds, and you know, Alex is a friend of mine, and. Just... Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. might move on to the final topic, mm. which is uh, tips basically on what are your thoughts if you're either a weaker player going into a match and you're playing a team that you think will outclass you, that you're going to beat, uh, is going to beat you. Uh, what are your thoughts on going in there? How should they address it? How should they not worry about that? And get focused on the bridge or otherwise vice versa what are your thoughts if you're the team that's expected to win or what's your psychology mm. psychology on the uh, going into a match where it looks like on paper it's going to be really one-sided Nick any ideas it's tough I mean I've been on the well I haven't I haven't played anywhere near as many knockout matches as you prepared and certainly nowhere even close to as many as Ataj so my experience is relatively lim limited but I have you know I've, I've kind of 
been on in both situations of I've been on teams favoured to win that have lost. Uh, I've been on teams that have been not well. Pretty rare for me to be on teams that are not favoured to win and actually win, but <laughs> um, but yeah, it's but anyway. The point of the point is sometimes I'm on teams that are highly unfavoured, um, and how you actually deal with it is kind of interesting. I mean, for me. Um, you know, playing the the NOT um, quarterfinal last year, uh, we were on a very inexperienced team. Um, it was um, myself and Glenn Coots, Vicky Buton, and um, Matthew Brown, and we, we were just a team of you know average age of about twenty or so, nineteen or twenty, I guess, maybe. maybe yeah. yeah. Um, and we were playing against. Um, Bill Jacobs, Ben Thompson, Phil Markey, Jos Williams, and yeah, we kind of had, you know, no one gave us a shot. We didn't really think that we had a huge shot, huge shot ourselves. But you kind of you don't think about it, you know. You go in there and you don't try and swing from the rafters. You don't, you know, let them take good boards off you because you're thinking, oh, they're so much better than us, you know, oh, there's this 300 with nine tricks, so I just, oh, you know, I can't take these nine tricks because they're such good players, you know. <laughs> it's, that's kind of one of the big things, I think. You know, when you start, you know, leaving the table, you start leaving the cards and start thinking about these things that are really extraneous. Um, that's when you you give these imps away. You give these imps to the team that, you know, that is favoured and so that makes it even harder for you to pull off an upset or you give teams these imps to a team that's not favoured and they, you know, you might give them a sniff. The, if I had a tip to to think of um, to give someone this position is, especially being on a non-favoured team playing against a highly favoured team, just enjoy the experience, you know, don't don't be intimidated. Don't um, feel as though you're going to be you're outplayed before you even sit down. There's a lot of value to gain from from these matches, you know. I mean, and you can, for a good example, from the other side, um, when Sataj and I were playing the semi-final of the 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 S knot this year um, against a really young team, uh, the Burged, and he's obviously got plenty of experience. Um, with Daniel Braun, Jamie, um, Jamie Thompson, and Stephen Stephen Williams, and you know, they were down by quite a lot at the, at the three quarter mark um, that they played on, and you know it was kind of I can respect that you know as a as a young guy wanting to get some experience playing playing top level bridge. But, you know, they came out of the set after about an hour or so. I mean, like, I would barely got down and started reading before Sataj and Tony were back out. I'm like, you guys are done? Like, And, you know, it's kind of, you know, I, I don't really get it, I guess. I'd rather just go in there and not throw cards around, not just bid like crazy because we're down 80 imps, so I better get them back by... Playing like an to be fair, game. to be fair to them, I mean, what I've seen this happen many times in my play, yeah. on both sides. When when you're stuck a big number in the last set, um, people tend to try one or two speculative things early on in the set. And if they go wrong, then they like, well, our 60 amps now become 85, and they have blah blah. They be blah, 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 blah. then they start losing. Not like they go in with that culture, but no. the, the culture decays very quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Mm. What are your thoughts? I don't recall. Um, well, I think in general, if you're, I mean, people are different. Everyone is different, right? Yeah. I think emotion in general is uh, is, a, is a distracting influence for for competitive success. Like you know, like you can do things in life. Not not everything has to be linked to success, you know. You, you, there's enjoyment, and there's you know we are human. One day we're gonna die. There is no grand uh, you know, immortality on offer to anybody. You know what I mean? So you do with your life whatever you wish. 
um, and you know if you want to play bridge a certain way, then that's your right. Um, but if your if your primary goal is competitive success, then you just have to accept that. I mean, for me, anyways, that emotion is just a distraction. Any emotion, whether you have any sort of preconceived notions you have and all of that stuff, is just distracting you from the task at hand. The task at hand is the hand you hold here right now. I'm not saying it's e it's very difficult to do it because you, have, you know, it's it's not easy to. So I mean, I think you know, um, different things work for different people. Like I said, and this may not work for others, but. I think the more you can distance yourself from this sort of story running in your mind about this, that, or the other, or from the, the sort of thoughts coming in your mind to, you know, oh my God, I'm going to look so bad, or oh my God, I can't believe you're losing to these chooks, and the guy can't even follow suit. You know, the more you can distance yourself from these sort of things, the, the more likely you are to deliver you know, what you're capable of, and then kind of do that. and. Hope the result goes away. Now, having said all of that, this I sound like some great Zen master, but I really struggle with it myself. But, but that's what I aspire to. Yeah. I reckon my biggest thing is realizing that everyone, and I mean everyone, makes so many mistakes, it's not funny. It's, this isn't a game where there is just one right answer all the time, and these top players just always find the perfect answer. They will offer things up. They might find higher percentage things than you regularly. But they're not perfect. They are making lots of mistakes, and you will get an opportunity at least. Right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think it was, it was in Michael Rosenberg's book. He's, he talked about there was a point when he realized he could be a very top player where he realized that everyone at the top was bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That may not be his words, but something to that effect. That everyone is, no one, no, sorry, his term was something like, no one is any good at this game, or something yeah. like that. And once I realized no one is any good, that kind of, you know, it's like, well, all right, well, I'm not any good either, but, you know, yeah. that yeah. doesn't stop me from becoming a top player. Some <laughs> words yeah. that he, a great book, by the way, Bridge Z. It is. It's, it's definitely worth it. Uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. He had, a, he had another piece, uh, you know, um, I can't remember if that was from the book or not, but he had this theory that a really good pair like actually a good pair, good partnership, mm. should win any pairs event they enter. If they're actually a good good partnership, and he reckoned that, you know, you put them in a pairs event and they can just claim it. Obviously, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really you know, surprised by this, yeah, by this claim, because I wouldn't agree with it. Yeah, go on. No, 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 I know. I mean, it's, it is <laughs> something else. And um, I've, I haven't there. You know, heard it explained in person, but I was thinking about it. And I was, I was thinking along the lines of, well, you know, a lot of these pairs events you see. I mean, maybe it's not every pair of pairs event I don't know, but certainly most of these pairs events, there's just, you know, just actually being solid as a rocket, and you know, picking your moments um, and being stable as a partnership, riding with the. You know the tops and bottoms that uh, that get dished out. It's you know it's really a, a mentality thing rather than a actual technique thing. It's just I'm going to commit to doing the to doing the things that my partnership has established as being important um, that we've thought about and we've actually practiced. Which goes back right to the start of this talk, um, as Sataj was saying, how actual practice is something that very few partnerships actually do. Um, but if you are committed to this, then you can just achieve very strong results. Um, and yeah, I think you can just, you know, this is one of the things you see, I mean, not, not with everyone, but I, I've watched a lot more, a lot more of the bridge videos, um, specifically, um, these videos from the cheating scandals and so on, where you're watching people playing at the table, and normally the focus is on, you know, the accused. But actually, I found it interesting watching the guys playing against them as well. Yeah. You know, these are some of the best guys, best players in the world. You know, um, who were kind of like not being robbed blind, but some of them were, some of them, <laughs> including whatever. The point, the point is, you know, they would get these 
disastrous results when, you know, effectively all the guy did was cheat against them. You know, that you could argue this, you could argue that, but actually the guy just knew what to leave because his partner told him, or he knew how many cards were here because his partner told him, and he did the right thing. And this, you know, this unfortunate expert partnership achieved a bad result because they were on the receiving end of it. But actually, the thing that I found most interesting is watching the demeanor of the guys, you know? Most of them don't get phased at all. They don't get rattled. They, you know, they sit there, they write down their minus 100, or they, uh, you know, um, and they just move on to the next hand. And I know, and we, all, we all know that as bridge players, we're a very temperamental lot, um, Very can be very emotional, and a lot of the guys are, Certain, even some of these guys who were filmed are very emotional people, especially away from the table. But actually, the, some of these partnerships that I think are probably some of the really top partnerships, um, they were just, you know, they'd clearly decided in their partnership that getting emotional, getting upset with these results isn't worth it. You know, so they're just going to sit there, go back to playing their game regardless of how bad or how good the previous board was. And it's what works for them, you know. It, it's what works in general. It's, it's, it's what it, makes you... It's it. a good thing to aspire to, yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, on that note, uh, we might uh, wrap up 